So uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to talk. Uh, can you see my slide? You can see um, your screen, but we can't see the slide. Maybe move to the next slide. We can hear you very well. How about now? Yes, we can see that. OK. So as you all know, we've been working to um, target uh, bone marrow stem cells as a way to fix sickle cell disease. And as Emily mentioned earlier, this has implications to other diseases uh, like HIV. And so we can either replace, as has been talked about already, or repair hematopoietic stem cells, either um, you know, by taking them out and manipulating them, or even now, hopefully, uh, we may be able to target them in vivo. So we've been focused on two approaches, one allogeneic from a MAT sibling, it's been most successful. And those patients have greater than 95% cure rates now, but most don't have a donor. So we've been working in parallel on autologous uh, gene therapy. And I'll show you today our efforts to actually transfer the beta globin gene with an engineered virus, though we hope, uh, as Matt showed earlier, uh, to be able to, to move to gene editing as well. So for this approach, we're just adding a gene. So we use a viral vector like a Trojan horse that we insert the beta globin gene and the regulatory elements that uh, drive erythroid specific expression. And uh, then once that's in the cell and integrates into the DNA, we hope that this will provide for normal hemoglobin production. But there are very stringent requirements that took more than a couple of decades to get all of this into a vector. Uh, including sustained high-level lineage uh, restricted expression of the therapeutic uh, globin sufficient to overcome the hemoglobin S, which we leave in place with a gene addition strategy. So when we finally got there in animal models, we partnered with Bluebird Bio to start the HEB206 study, which is a study of HIV-based uh, vector gene therapy for sickle cell disease with um, now enrollment uh, at 12 years of age or greater in patients with a history of uh, severe disease, adequate organ function, and no prior transplant. And this evolved over time, because at first in group A, we were collecting bone marrow as a source. We had no pre-collection transfusion regimen requirement, and we used an original transduction method. In group B, we required pre-collection transfusions to get the disease settled down and continued collecting uh, hematopoietic stem cells from the marrow, but improved on the transduction method to get the vector uh, in a higher frequency of hematopoietic stem cells. And then in group C, we moved to mobilization with chlorexaphore, as has also been uh, mentioned earlier. So these cells then go to a central manufacturing uh, facility where they're transduced with the lentiviral vector that has the correctly spelled beta globin gene with one additional change, this T87Q, which makes it more anti-sickling. And then those cells are frozen. And when a lot release criteria are met, the patient comes back in gets myeloablative conditioning with busulfan, and then we follow uh, for up to 17 years. This shows the current study disposition. We've consented 60 patients, nine in group A, seven underwent uh, transplant and have long-term follow-up now, two in group B, and we move quickly to mobilization with chlorexaphore in group C because it went so well in these two patients who had chlorexaphore mobilization for backup harvest. And now we've, um, We've accrued 49 patients in group C and 17 have undergone transplantation. So I can show you the follow-up data. First in groups A and B, we had pretty typical uh, transplant related complications. So stomatitis, febrile neutropenia requiring antibiotics, vaso-occlusive pain being the, the most uh, frequent uh, events. There were no graft failures or deaths, um, no cases of hepatic venoocclusive occlusive disease from busulfan, no replication competent. Uh, lentivirus, and the population of hematopoietic stem cells is highly uh, polyclonal. We unfortunately had one grade four severe adverse event of myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, which is um, which we traced to uh, the busulfan conditioning. It's a, there was no vector integrated uh, in this uh, unfortunate uh, side effect. So in group A, we had um, a pretty good vector copy number in vitro, around one, but that declined uh, precipitously after infusion to around 0.1. So we only had robust 
we did not have robust uh, contribution by vector. You can see there's a modest contribution shown in pink here uh, towards the total hemoglobin with this patient six and nine having the highest contribution and having an improvement in their hemoglobin to almost 11. But this was not a home run. We were intending to make this look like an allergen egg transplantation. So we moved on to refined manufacturing. And you can see with uh, refined manufacturing, we got the vector copy number from 0.6 to 3 copies of the vector per cell. The percentage from 25 to almost 90% of the cells transduced. And the number of cells was also uh, improved with that manufacturing. So now you can see in the two patients in group B, a more robust a vector copy number over time that's stable, doesn't drop, and that contributes significantly to the hemoglobin at uh, three grams or six grams total uh, coming uh, from vector. And here you can see their hemoglobins uh, compared to group A, uh, which are near normal or normal, with um, in the second patient in group, a, group B, about half of it coming from vector. So we moved on to group C, where we could use Plurex4 mobilization, uh, hoping to get uh, a higher number of cells. We had done some work in the lab and realized that uh, though we had predicted that steady state, hemat uh, steady state bone marrow was going to be a, a good source for hematopoietic stem cells, uh, in patients with sickle cell disease, there was lots of clumping, adhesion of red cells to CD34s that just complicated the downstream uh, processing. And this was much better when we used uh, plurexiform mobilization. So here you can see now the, the plurexiform mobilized products superimposed on those graphs with high vector copy numbers still at 3.8, around 80% uh, transduced in a very high uh, cell number, CD34 number, uh, when compared to using a bone marrow. Uh, in fact, mobilization with plurexifor uh, was safer uh, in terms of severe adverse events than um, harvesting bone marrow. Bone marrow harvesting, we had uh, uh, 18 greater than or equal to grade three adverse events um, in the 11 patients that we did bone marrow harvest in, as opposed to the 14 patients uh, that we did uh, apheresis in, we had only five. So much fewer adverse events uh, with plurexifor mobilization than with bone marrow harvesting. Uh, and the product characteristics for group C in those 17 that we've transplanted uh, are quite good. Um, uh, CD34 cells collected per mobilization were 10 million per kg. We achieved a very high uh, busulfan area under the curve. We have almost a year of follow-up, platelet engraftment, and hospital duration was as predicted. And importantly, again, shown here, vector copy number 3.6% transduced 80%, and CD34 dose per kg ultimately of 6.3. Safety profile was similar to what we saw in groups uh, A and B with uh, you know, no rec replication competent lentivirus uh, and no evidence of clonal dominance. And, and the usual things that we see with an autologous uh, transplant, again, febrile neutropenia, stomatitis being uh, the most common. This shows a vector copy number in group C, which is now sustained um, as high as uh, 4.5. Uh, it's, it's not actually going up as it appears here. This is just a single uh, patient at the 15 month follow-up who has a very uh, high vector copy number, but uh, sustained over time uh, and above one. And this shows the hemoglobin fractions post-treatment. So again, in pink, is the fraction derived from vector. This is the T87Q. And uh, in green is uh, the hemoglobin S. So you can see that after uh, uh, six months, we have greater than 40% of the hemoglobin coming from vector. And that steadily rises over time. And this last patient, who's now 21 months uh, with hemoglobin follow-up, uh, has a normal hemoglobin of 15.2, with about 60% of it uh, coming uh, from vector. Markers and hemolysis have also uh, improved over time with near normalization of the reticulocyte count, uh, LDH, uh, and total bilirubin. And uh, part of this uh, study is powered on reduction in uh, uh, pain events. So here you can see the 24 months uh, 
prior to informed consent in this population with a median of four or two uh, events per year, uh, ranging from four over the prior two years to 28 uh, pain events. And you can see after we only had one event, which was a grade two uh, vaso-occlusive crisis uh, post-transplant. So in summary, uh, so far, gene addition uh, using a viral vector uh, uh, has a safety profile that's consistent with the agent that's used to prepare the patient. We hope to make that better by moving to less toxic agents. Uh, in group C, we see no serious VOCs or acute chest syndrome uh, after treatment. And we've seen a 99% reduction in the annualized rates of VOC and acute chest syndrome. And as I said, the median hemoglobin level for hemoglobin S were less than 60% in all patients past uh, six months. And the median total unsupported hemoglobin was greater than 10. Of course, we need longer follow-up for durability and safety, and, and, and um, we're planning some future studies to look again specifically at pain, and then hopefully also at um, uh, stroke uh, with, with this strategy. So with, with that, I'll acknowledge uh, the large crew that's contributed to this, and. Um, uh, hope that I've kept this on time. <laughs>